All right, well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. All right, good to be here. Turn, if you would, please, in your copy of God's Word to the first book of Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter number 18. 1 Samuel, chapter number 18. Uh, we're going through, of course, uh, the life of David. Not exactly every single verse uh, that we see in First and Second Samuel, not every single psalm, but I do want to touch on the a number of points th throughout his life. As we travel really throughout uh, the scriptures, whether it be in uh, 1 Samuel or any other book, and we come across stories, uh, it's amazing, isn't it? The, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right? Um, the, the people of the Bible were human beings just like you and me, of course. Uh, different challenges, perhaps. Uh, but you, we've come, of course, we've been introduced to Saul. Saul is a weak leader. Uh, and him being a weak leader, usually weak leaders will find other people to blame for their poor decision making and, and or mistakes, right? Uh, and, but that's even the culture that we live in. We live in a culture where people have a hard time owning up to poor decision making. Uh, we, we see, like, take for instance, crime is on the rise. So what is, what is the, the reason for crime? Well, that's easy, sin. I mean, what, what, that's, everything goes back to sin, obviously. Uh, but that's not what you're hearing. Okay, so why is crime on our, well, we're not spending enough money in government programs, or we have uh, lenient gun laws, or, you know, just uh, uh, mental illness issues, you know, throughout our society, and we're not paying it more attention, we should pay more attention, on and on and on, when we all know the problem is sin. Uh, you take, for instance, someone commits a, a heinous crime. If you've got the right attorney, and you can find the right psychiatrist, guess what? You're innocent by reason of insanity. Which, by the way, I can't find anywhere in my Bible. Uh, because a crime has been committed. Someone has lost their life. How could you be innocent? Innocent of anything. But again, we live in a society in which we love to pin the blame on other people, anyone in fact, but ourselves. And Saul has done this, you recall, uh, he, he, he's approached by Samuel, you didn't listen to the Lord, you should have uh, uh, taken out all the Amalekites and destroyed everything, right? The cattle and the sheep and everything. And what did he say? Did he own up to it? No, no, he blamed the people. That's what they wanted. No, it was your decision. And so nothing has really changed. Saul is a poor leader. He's a poor leader, and so he's going to find other people to blame. David, on the other hand, is not a poor leader. In fact, he's a very good leader. He's very good. And as you'll see in this lesson, not only is he a good leader, but his popularity is going to explode. He is beloved. He is beloved. You will see by a number, a number of people. And Saul will hate him for that. In this lesson, you're going to see how envy and jealousy can creep into the heart and envy and jealousy is going to creep in the heart of Saul, and it will destroy him. And the lesson for us is, when we allow something like an envy or a jealousy to creep into our hearts, we can very well expect the same. 1 Samuel chapter 18, beginning of verse number 1. Now it came about, when he had finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul sent him over the men of war. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. It happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands. And David is 10,000. 
Then Saul became very angry, for this saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have only ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Father, we do come before you. We thank you, Lord, for your, the word that you have preserved. It is an errant, is an infallible. And Lord, we also thank you for your spirit, which allows us to even understand what is on the pages of your scripture. We ask now for understanding as we go through this passage that you've preserved. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that we can glean from it and apply these valuable lessons that we find here in this message. We pray, Lord, these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. God has rejected Saul as being the king. Instead, he has chosen a man after his own heart. David has been anointed. Saul has been rejected. David has been empowered by God's Holy Spirit. And that very Holy Spirit that has empowered him has left Saul. That's that spirit that even enabled Saul to go about doing kingly work, that is gone now. Nevertheless, Saul is still on the throne. And that's a problem, right? Saul still has the crown, he still has the authority, he still has the power, he's still on the throne. Now how is God going to get his guy in the palace? And no one no one could envision how that was going to happen. I was drawn back when I thought about this earlier, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's gracious thoughts are beyond our human imagination. Romans 11, verse 33, Paul says, Oh, the depth and the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. No one would ever, nor could they ever, envision how God was going to get Saul off the throne and his man after his own heart on the throne. No one could see that coming. Not even the angels. And so now we come to chapter 18. Saul is going to be replaced. He doesn't know by who yet. He just knows it's someone that's better than him. And there's this contrast, as you will see, between Saul and David, and David and Saul. You'll see Saul's opinion of David. We already know what David's opinion is of Saul, but Saul's opinion of David, and then you'll also see everyone else's opinion of David. Saul's enthusiasm, you may say, for David is going to disintegrate and deteriorate, and is going to deteriorate into suspicion and then fear. But everyone else's opinion of David is going to go off the charts, and he's going to gain more popularity each and every day with each and every victory. We're introduced to Jonathan, verse number three, then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan is the son of the king. From an earthly perspective, Jonathan is the rightful heir. Jonathan will be the next king from an earthly perspective. But from a heavenly perspective, David will be the king. He's already been anointed. So Jonathan is, of course, the rightful heir, but David has been anointed by God through Samuel for the very same throne. Two men vying for the very same crown. And yet you're going to see, not only in this lesson, but the lessons to follow, there is no envy between these two individuals. There is no jealousy between these two individuals. Be this rela loving relationship between Jonathan and David, there's nothing. There's no ambition that could break this friendship up. Nothing. I was listening to uh, a message earlier this week. Those of you familiar with Moody, Moody Radio, Alistair Begg. And Alistair Begg said it this way. He said, 
if you have one friend, just one friend, who will tolerate you no matter what, who will be honest with you, who wants you to be honest with them no matter what, that will love you unconditionally, if you have one friend who will never, ever leave your side, you are rich. You're rich. And he said, if you have two friends like that, you're a multimillionaire. Friends. Friends are hard to come by. We call people friends when actually they're just acquaintances. Jonathan loved David. Loved him. And look what he does. He strips off what made him a warrior. He strips off really what was eventually make him a king. And he, he lays it down. He lays it, he willingly lays it down. Jonathan is the crown prince. But he understands David is anointed. That's God's man. And still, Jonathan, the scriptures and our, authors tell, our author tells you, Jonathan loved him as himself. What a wonderful brotherly relationship these two men have. Yeah, of course, they can call the God of Israel their father. But the love that they had for one another, the respect that they had for one another, one of the most beautiful relationships that we have in the scriptures. Now, we also read, Saul loved David. Hmm. Well, not exactly. Saul loved David kind of like the way I love brownies. Right? All right. They, they, it's, you, love, you love brownies because they make me happy. Saul loved David because David was successful. And David could make Saul look good. Right? So that's why he loved David. It's not a real love. As you see, and you will continue to see, everything David touches turns to gold. At this point in David's life, he is unbeatable. Unbeatable. Verse 6, it happened as they were coming. When David returned from killing the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul. And this is great news. They've come back and they've got their musical instruments and everything and they're singing. They can't, they're coming and, they're, and, they're, and, and you know who did that. Well, that was me. I was the one who signed off on, on the dotted line. I was the one who sent David out there to face Goliath. I was the one who gave him the go-ahead. I was the one who sent David with the men, and now the Philistines are on the run. Of course, I will get the credit for this, as I rightfully deserve. Right? They will see. All the people will see. I made a great choice. Verse 7, the women sang as they played. I bet you they did. And said, Saul has slain his thousands. Ooh. And David is 10,000. Excuse me. He was not expecting that. Now, what is a little interesting is really when you go into Hebraic literature and songs and things like that, this is not unusual. We see it in the scriptures we, uh, about uh, the heavenly host, right? And they speak of thousands and thousands and thousands. So the, the second line is more of an addition, it's almost like a hyperbole of, of what is going on. So really, I don't see that the women are intentionally trying to ridicule Saul. I really don't. In fact, our author says they came out to meet King Saul. It doesn't say they came out to meet David. They came to meet Saul. They mentioned Saul first. But Saul, in his mind, he's not ready for this. He slew, yes, he slew thousands. But David slew more. Now, everything David touches, as I just said moments ago, is turning to gold, and that's a great thing. But he's the one that's getting credit for this. And of course, an egocentric, self-serving, conniving individual like Saul is going to look out for himself. Of course. The contrast, as you see between these two men, David is not like that. David has a servant's heart. God put that heart in him. 
And David wants to serve his Lord and, and worship his Lord and bring glory and honor and majesty to God's name. He said that, remember, that all the nations, all the peoples will know there is a God in Israel. That's where his focus is. That is not where Saul's focus is. Now, it's not like Saul wasn't successful. They say he slayed his thousands. David, more successful. In fact, Saul is just pondering these things. He's just about better at everything. And the words of Samuel come back. The words of Samuel, when Samuel looked at him after that, that his atrocious, poor decision-making, and then blaming it on other people. And what did Samuel tell him? Chapter 15, verse 28. He told him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you better than you. And I look at it, and he's better than me. And as you see, and you will see with this story, a weak leader becomes a frightened leader, and weak, frightened leaders become dangerous leaders. Verse 9, Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. You've got to imagine, when Samuel said those words, your kingdom has been torn from you and is given to your neighbor who's better than you, who's better than me. And imagine the, the months and the years that passed after that. All that time, and Saul is thinking, who? And he's looking maybe at his administrators, and he's looking at the counselors, and he's looking at the staff, and he's looking at the military commanders and all, and he's wondering, who is it? Better than me. He's better than you. And then this happens. And it's like the light bulb goes off. And he looked at him. If looks could kill, right? He looked at him, and after all that time, now he knows. That's the one. That's the one. Proverbs 27, verse 4. Wrath is fierce and anger is a flood, but who can stand before jealousy? Proverbs 14, verse 30. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. I have to admit, I've always looked at those two words is somewhat synonymous. And then I come to find out, really, they're not. Uh, Dr. Gary Collins writes, he says, there is a distinction between jealousy and envy. To envy is to want something which belongs to another person. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, his wife or his servant, or his ox or donkey, or anything belongs to your neighbor. In contrast, jealousy is the fear that something which we possess will be taken away by another person. Although jealousy can apply to our jobs, our possessions, or our reputations, the word more often refers to anxiety, which comes when we are afraid that the affections of a loved one might be lost to a rival. We fear that our mates, or perhaps our children, will be lured away by some other person who, when compared to us, seems to be more attractive, capable, and successful. End quote. And you're going to now see Envy and jealousy is now creeping into the heart of Saul, and it will destroy him. Envy. Saul sees the admiration for David, and he, and he hears the singing, and he sees the confetti, right? And, man, David is on all the magazine covers, and he sees this, and envy. Envy creeps into his heart. Warren W. Wearsby writes, Envy is the pain we feel within when somebody achieves or receives what we think belongs to us. So now, not only has he got envy going on, he's got jealousy. Because guess what? Now I know. Now I found the man, the one who is better than me. 
and I have this crown, and I have this throne, and I'm not going to give it up. I'm not going to give it up. James chapter 3, beginning of verse 14. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. And so now, envy and jealousy is going to creep into the heart of Saul. And I have told you numerous times, there's always those who are watching. And those who are watching take advantage. They take advantage of human weakness. The spirit world is always watching you. And look what happens, verse 10. Now it came about on the next day. You notice, they don't wait long. On the next day, that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul, and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand as usual, and a spear was in Saul's hand. Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. The spirit world is always watching you. God's angels are watching over you. The demons are watching, formulating a game plan. They know you. They know you better than your spouse. Because they're there. And they don't forget. And they put together game plans. They know your strengths, and they know your weaknesses. They will never, never attack your strengths. They will attack weaknesses. The demonic realm is opportunistic. They take advantage of weaknesses in human beings. Paul mentions this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. They're watching. They know. They know your strengths and they know your weaknesses. And this evil spirit has been watching Saul. Now, what you and I also have to know is demons are rarely the source of evil in this world. Evil in this world is mainly almost always caused by sinful behavior due to our own sin nature. Okay? Paul says in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19, now the deeds of the flesh, not the deeds of the demons, the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We have to be careful and take inventory every single day. What are my weaknesses? Because if we don't, and, and I told you in a previous lesson, we can allow things to gain a beachhead. You've got to think of like a war. Once the enemy gains a beachhead, guess what? You can now move jeeps on, you can move track, uh, uh, tanks on, you can move more soldiers and rations and, and, and equipment and ammunition, all in there because you gained a beachhead. And you can allow this, the unclean spirit world to have a stronghold if you allow them to. Now, a demon can't possess you because you're a believer. No house divided can stand. You have the Holy Spirit in you. But that doesn't mean that those demons can't make your life miserable. And for an unbeliever, an unbeliever who traffics in that world, like what Paul just told you in Galatians 5, when an unbeliever traffics in that world, you are then opening yourself up to demonic possession. There's nothing to protect you for an unbeliever. Robert L. Deffenbaugh writes, the use of illegal drugs, and perhaps some illegal ones, surrendering oneself to illicit sex, or to fits of rage or other evils, may well open the door for satanic and demonic attack. Let us be careful not to give Satan too much credit by making him the cause of evil rather than an opportunist 
who simply promotes and enhances the evil within our fallen natures. So when you, somebody says, well, the devil made me do it. No, you're just full of the devil. Right? Stop blaming the devil for everything. All right, That's just pushing the blame off on someone else. We're seeing an uptick in our society over the last several years with, of course, increased homelessness. I mentioned this before. Folks, we've had home, homeless people in our country for over 200 years. Okay. You know what's different about many, a number of the homeless people now? They're becoming violent. That's something we haven't seen before. And again, it all goes, it's all in that world. A world of drugs, where every single day, I just want the drugs. I just want, so they can't hold on to a job. I just want the drugs, got to have the drugs. And you open yourself up, especially mind-bending drugs. And demons will take advantage of that. Then you couple in the fact that our society and our culture, our nation, is just immersed in darkness. I mean, if you call for the demons, they will come. And so now you're seeing all these violent homeless people. And now, my goodness, where are all these UFOs coming from? Duh. If you call them, they will come. The demons will come. They're opportunists. And when one takes possession of an unbeliever, then that individual will go through mood swings that are very intense, which can lead to violent, violent behavior. This, what we have here, is demonic, coupled with Saul's envy and jealousy. Coupled with it. I mean, it makes for a nasty cocktail. And God allowed it. God allowed it. An evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul. Some people struggle with that. Why? All that's saying is, this is judgment upon Saul. This is judgment. You refuse to repent. You refuse to repent. You refuse to follow orders. You won't bend a knee to me. You continue to lie. You continue, and on and on. And guess what God says? I'm going, to, I'm going to turn you over to that world. I'm just going to turn you on over. It appears it could be the very same spirit we saw back in 1 Samuel 16, 14. But it's judgment. This is judgment. And now you're going to see when someone is envious and when jealousy is brewing in a heart, it will turn into anger. There has never been a murder that's been committed that didn't start with anger. Yeshua told you that. You say you shall not murder. I'm telling you, if you have anger in your heart, you've already murdered. Okay? There's a difference between manslaughter and murder. I'm talking murder. It always started with anger against somebody, against a spouse, against a lover, against an employer, against somebody. Right? There's anger there. And that individual turns homicidal. Look what happens. Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. And now we have a king that's homicidal. But David escaped from his presence twice. Don't miss that. Because there's your contrast again between these two individuals. David's aim in our last lesson was divinely orchestrated. I mean, that smooth stone hit its mark. Saul is hurling spears left and right and can't his, hit his mark. Verse 12. Now Saul was afraid. Why? Why should he be afraid? He's got the crown. He's got the authority. He's got the scepter. He's got the spear. Why should he be afraid? Well, our author tells you, for the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul... Your kingdom is on life support. And now he knows it because he's found the man. After these months and years, I found him. And he's better than me. He's better than me in every way. Verse 13, Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and appointed him as his commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. David was prospering in all his ways, for the Lord was with him. When Saul saw that he was prospering greatly, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, 
and he went out and came in before them. Again, instead of simply Saul bending the knee before the true and living God and repenting, what does he do? Get out of here. He removes David. And he comes up with a plan. I know what I'm going to do. It's a win-win situation. I can't lose. I'm going to send him out to battle. He gives him, he appoints him uh, as a commander over a thousand. I don't know if that's a demotion, a promotion, whatever, but for Saul, I'm going to put him in a situation where I can't lose. If he dies, right, well, it's the Philistines that killed him. If he simply loses the battle, well, then he'll be disgraced and he'll be the laughingstock. It's a win-win situation for Saul. Unfortunately, it's a lose-lose situation for Saul because look what happened. David was prospering in all his ways, which is not easy when the enemy is trying to kill you. How? You, you can look at this, and I'm, I'm, I have to admit, I don't know if I could do this. He, David is keeping his composure against a man who is trying to kill him and is setting him up. How is he able to do this? For the Lord was with him. There's a peace. There's a peace. He knows who's in charge. He knows he's been anointed. I've been anointed. So in essence, really, Saul can't touch me. And he knows it. When Saul saw that he was prospering greatly, he dreaded him. The plan backfired. Right? My goodness. I threw spears at him a couple times. That hasn't worked. I put him out in the battlefield. That hasn't worked. In fact, you're mean. It's gotten worse. They love him more and more. This is, this is terrible. All Israel and Judah love David. All. This is not what he had planned. All the tribes of Israel, all the tribes of Judah, you're going to come to... Jonathan, my own son, loves him. He can't lose. He's piling up victories. He's making me... The women are singing about him. I guess, what's next? Probably my daughter will love him too. No, that can never happen. All Israel and Judah love David. And the more you think about it, that could have been a spear. David could have used that as a spear. Say, hey, look at my poll numbers. Right? I mean, I'm gaining in the polls. You're losing in the polls. I'm piling up victory after victory. They're singing about me. They're dancing about me. They got the confetti. I'm on GQ magazine. I'm showing up on Ricky Lake show. You know, all this, that, and the other. He could have used that as a spear. And right through your heart, Saul. And he doesn't do it. He didn't do it. We talk a lot. Everybody's a victim in our culture. Everybody's a victim. I'm a victim. You're a victim. Wouldn't you like to be a victim too? Everybody wants to be a victim. You know why? Because once you're a victim, you expect something. David is a victim, and he never acted like one. Never acted like one. Now, before we get to verse 17, let's talk about a dowry, because that is certainly not in our culture. I mean, that's a weird one. Not really. But here we go. A dowry is a bride price. So, the groom... A young fellow meets a young lady. Not some guy meeting another guy. A guy meets a girl. And they are betrothed. Betrothed. The betrothal is, is a contract. Okay? For all intents and purposes. They're wedded, but they're just not married. Okay? It's official. They're betrothed. In fact, to, to break a betrothal or an engagement, you, it would have, there would have to be paperwork. Okay, so they're betrothed. The bride doesn't know the day of the wedding. No idea. So the groom goes off, the bridegroom goes off, and he prepares a place. Because I'm, I'm going to come someday, I'm going to get you. And we're going to be together forever and ever. And so he's gonna, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he's preparing a home for his bride, and they can have a family, and on and on and on. The bride has no idea when the wedding day is. All she knows is, I have to be ready. 
because someday my groom will come. And when he comes, there's going to be a shofar blast. When he comes, so now the place is ready. The time has come. The groom grabs his, his, his wedding party. They make their way to the house of his bride. Right? They blow the shofar. Today's the day. Get your wedding dress. You're coming home with me. He would pay a bride price to the father of the bride, of the daughter. Because in that culture, the daughters helped mainly around the house. Whether it's mending, sewing, cooking, cleaning, all of those things. The young fellas were usually doing trades, farming, all those kind of things. Now, if I'm taking your daughter from you, I give you the bride price, so then you can take that money and you could go and find a servant to help out in the house because the girl's not there anymore. The higher the position of the daughter and the family, the more you have to pay. Ah, okay, 17. Then Saul said, and I want you to notice the difference between what he's saying and what he's thinking. Then Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter Merib. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be a valiant man for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, my hand shall not be against them, but let the hand of the Philistines be against them. But David said to Saul, Who am I and what is my life or my family's, a father's family in Israel, that I should be the king's son-in-law? David is coming from humble beginnings. He's a, he's a shepherd of his father's flock. I mean, if Jesse had any kind of money at all, do you think he would be sending one of his boys out there? He just hire somebody. They don't have a lot of money. You know, Merib... She's not just any daughter. She's the daughter of the king. You want to talk about taking out a cash advance. And Saul knows that. And Saul took advantage of it. Because Saul is a conniving individual. It's one of these facts of life as we look at this story. Okay? Unfortunately, I wish it wasn't true, but it's proverbial. Not everyone who performs righteous deeds have righteous thoughts. Okay. Not everyone who performs a righteous deed or act for you has good intention. As we say in our culture, there's some strings attached. Proverbs 23, verse 1, When you sit down to dine with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you. And put a knife to your throat if you are a man of great appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for it is deceptive food. When, when, the, when the king pushes the plate across the table to you, full of food, or when they, 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 somebody pushes the check across the table to you, many churches, when the wealthy donor pushes the check across the table to the pastor, there are strings attached. They, there's a motive behind the eyes. Be careful. Okay? Notice the discrepancy between what Saul is thinking and what Saul is planning and then what he's actually saying and doing. He says this one. Be a valiant man for me and fight the Lord's battles. Wow. It's an insidious trap. What makes it worse? He invokes the Lord's name. Ooh. If you take nothing else from this lesson today, there was a, unfortunately, it's a true story. There was a couple many years ago in our congregation that decided, they made the announcement and said, on a, on a Saturday evening, we were doing Havdalah, they made an announcement to everybody and said, we, we have been praying on this matter, we've been seeking the Lord's face on this matter, and we have made the decision to leave Bessar Shalom. Came as a shock. Where they wound up going, it wasn't like they moved away. No, they stayed right where they were. They left here and went to, of all places, Chabad. Which, for those who don't know, is a synagogue simply in, a, in, a, in a, a branch of Judaism which 
denies the Messiahship and the Lordship of Yeshua. So in other words, what they, what they said publicly in front of everybody is that Yeshua's Holy Spirit told them to leave to go worship at a place that denies his Holy Spirit. You took the Lord's name in vain. Okay, Not only that, you've been exposed as a liar. Because that wasn't the case. And you and I, we always have to learn. Okay, Sometimes, has it ever occurred to you, your plan may be in direct opposition to God's plan. Your will doesn't match up with his will. And we make a whole lot of plans. And I'm going to do this, and we're going to do this, and I'm going to do this. Did you pray about the matter? Did you fast and pray about it? Did you seek others to help you in prayer? Did you, what did you do to come to this conclusion? And then to say, well, the Lord is leading us, or leading me to this. And he had nothing to do with it. He says in his word, don't listen to the false prophet. I didn't put those words in their mouth. You're taking his name in vain. It is better to just say. It is better eternally to say. It might be embarrassing now, but it's better eternally to just say, this is my plan, or this is our plan. We have not consulted God in this. In fact, we want his blessing. We would like it to work out. I would like this to work out. But I don't know, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's better to do that than to say, oh, this is his plan. Because his plans always come to fruition 100% of the time. Every single plan that God has ever enacted has come to fruition. He is batting a thousand. You and I are not. It is better to just say, it's on me, than to pin the blame on him. Because when it falls apart, Oh, well, that was, you know, we had a missionary family. Oh, I'm talking 30 years ago. I don't know what uh, part of the world they went off to. It was a family. It was a husband and a wife. They must have had five children because you can't be a missionary without at least five kids. And, and they went off to become missionaries because they're going to do the Lord's work. And kid you not, within six to 12 months, they were back in the church. They had no money, they had did this, did this. Is that how God operates? So whose plan was it? Was it their plan or his? Because he always funds his plan. Saul is attaching God's name to this thing, which is blasphemy. Blasphemy. Again, what he's saying and what he's doing doesn't match up what he's thinking. Watch, let the hand of the Philistines be against him. I mean, like Pilate, right? Hey, washing my hands of this. And when you think about it, really, their spears are just as sharp as mine. Think about it. Saul is going to use the heathen to destroy the servant of God. And we come to know, we know, he would not know, is the direct lineage to the Messiah himself. Verse 19, so it came about at the time when Merib, Saul's daughter should have been given to David that she was given to Adriel, the Mahalathite, for a wife. wonder why. The author doesn't tell you. So we're kind of left to speculate, which is kind of fun. All right. Is it David? He went, eh, I'm not too crazy about the deal. Right. Was it Merib? Where she said, I'm not too crazy about David. In fact, I want to marry Adriel. We've known each other since we were little. Whatever it was, Saul's plan, again, did not come to fruition. Another one fails. But it opens up a door for Saul. Look at verse 20. Now Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. That might give us a little indication about Merib. I mean, if Michal loves him, maybe Merib really didn't. Eh, not too crazy about him. All, he's always talking about God all the time. Always talking about the Torah all the time. Right? He's always talking about all this righteousness and holiness. Not for me. Who knows? Now Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. When they told Saul the thing was agreeable to him, Saul thought, and he goes thinking again, I will give her to him that she may become a snare to him. 
and that the hand of the Philistines may be against them. Therefore Saul said to David, for a second time, you may be my son-in-law today. Then Saul commanded his servants, speak to David secretly, saying, behold, the king delights in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke these words to David. But David said, is it trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law, since I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? The servants of Saul reported to him according to these words which David spoke. Saul then said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. A lot of thinking and saying and planning and true love. True love. True love can only come from God, because God is love. So even, even if you take two unbelievers, they've been married for 50 years. So, oh, I love her. But not with God's love. Because you don't have his spirit. It's just emotion. But true love, true love is a product of knowing God in an intimate way. And that's the love you get from him. It's sacrificial. So you have here a love. As our author says, she loved David. Well, I think your author here is telling you she loved David like Saul loved David. They, hey, he's popular. He's handsome. Come on. Probably got one of them little dimples in his chin. Nice jawline. Right? And he's appearing on all the GQ covers. Right? And he's gaining all these victories. And the, and the tambourines are playing. And the confetti is flying. Right? What's not to love about David? And I think she's fascinated with that. She's fascinated. Like Team B. Right? She's just fascinated by that. I mean, you know, Tom Brady, six Super Bowl rings. You know, wow. You know. She loves the hero, but it's not true love. And so you will see eventually that she will ridicule him and she will despise him. So it's not love. Okay, Michal loved David. And notice this please Saul. Okay? He doesn't care about his own daughters. He's going to use his own daughters just to satisfy his own envy and jealousy. I, I'm willing to sacrifice the happiness of my daughters just to get him. So we call love David. She's the new bride to be. But notice the dowry has changed. The dowry has changed. A hundred foreskins of the Philistines, which is actually something that David can attain. Unbeknownst to Saul, Saul thinks David's goose is cooked. I got him now. Wrong. Wrong. And now that I'm thinking about it, didn't David already pay the dowry? In our last lesson, he went out and killed Goliath. Didn't they say, hey, if you go out and kill this guy, right? He's going to hook you up with a bride, right? The IRS will lay off you. I mean, you get, you know, it's kind of like you want one cash lump sum because you cashed the lottery ticket in, or you want like, you know, installment plan or something here. You know, what, what it, I thought he paid the dowry. No. See, he understands, as we say, like in the sports world or even uh, in our culture, the, the goalposts have been moved. See? It's like you're at work, and if you do this, you'll get the promotion. And then you do it, and they say, well, I need you to do this. See, they change, they move the goalposts. But David knows. David knows his God is still on the throne. Romans 8 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? For David, I'm anointed. I'm the next king. May not feel like it today, but it's going to come to pass because God has already said it. And David also knew his God was the God of Joseph. And look what God did for Joseph. See? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. So I don't know how this is going to turn out. I just know God's got my back. Verse 26, when his servants told David these words, it pleased David to become the king's son-in-law. Before the days had expired, David rose up and went, he and his men, and struck down 200 men among the Philistines. Then David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. So Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, 
for a wife. I wonder, did it please David because Michal was just a knockout? Or did it please David because, man, you know, I get to kill more Philistines. And this is great. Or a combination of the two. Right? All right. But whatever it is, I, when we read our Bibles, I mean, who finds Bible study boring? How could this be boring? When we read our Bibles, don't you use the theater of your mind? I mean, really, like, what did it look like when the, when the animals got onto the ark? Right? And what did, if you've ever been, like, on a cruise ship or something, you see water, there's everywhere. That's what, you know, kind of like with Noah, there's just water everywhere, no land. And then, you know, when, when Israel walked on dry ground through the Red Sea, sorry, Cecil B. DeMille, I know you did your best, but it was awesome, right? And then, or the giving of the Torah, Sinai, where you got the whole mountain, in, in, in smoke and flames and there's thunder and there's lightning and the trumpets are blaring and all of that. And you, you, you paint this picture in your mind. We come to this, I'm not painting any pictures, right? This is the last thing. I, this one preacher said, aren't you glad you don't have an illustrated Bible? Whoa, I mean, man, I don't want to see what this looked like. You want me to bring back 100 foreskins. Do you one better. I'll bring home, I'll bring you 200. Sharpen up the knives, boys. Verse 28, when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, then Saul was even more afraid of David. Thus Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines went out to battle, and it happened as often as they went out that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so his name was highly esteemed. Continually. Continually. Saul could not get David out of his mind. Imagine, right, laying in bed, night after night, staring up at that ceiling. He's better than you. He's better than you. And the women are singing about him, and the tambourines are playing, and the parades, and the confetti, and Jonathan, my son, loves him. And all the tribes of Israel love him, and the tribes of Judah love him, and Michal loves him, and the men respect him, and the military adore him, and the women can't take their eyes off him, right? He's better than you. And it's just eating at him. To the point he says, I have to find a way to kill him. I have to find a way. The son of Jesse must die. In closing, David's stock is on the rise. If you have stock in Saul, sell it quickly. It's, it's about ready to bottom out. Okay, Get rid of it as quick as you can. Call your broker. But not only has Saul's plan backfired over and over and over, right? As the plans are backfiring, David is getting stronger and stronger. And he's getting more popular. And he's stronger, most importantly, in his Lord. God is molding this shepherd, not only into a warrior, but into a king. It's happening. It's happening. It doesn't come overnight. It's happening day by day. Saul has become frightened, weak, angry, envious, jealous, demon-possessed, homicidal maniac. And yet, and yet throughout this entire Saul-David narrative, David never looked at Saul as an enemy. Never did. Truly. Truly has a heart for God. What can we learn from just this? Well, it's not as if David created the problems for Saul. David revealed the problems in Saul. And those problems were in Saul before Saul ever became the king. See? That's it. That's it. But Israel, you were, you were too anxious. We've got to have a king like all the other nations. Okay. I will give you what you want. And I've said before, one of the worst things, or the worst thing, that God can ever give you is what you want. Because if what you want doesn't match up with what he wants, it is disaster. I will give you what you want. 
Saul it is. And it's not as if God didn't know all this existed in Saul. But being around David, it revealed all of that. And that's what you and I have to learn. I, speak, I think I speak for everyone listening to my voice. We all want to grow. We want to, we want to grow in Yeshua. We want to know his word more. We want to grow in our faith, have our faith stronger. Right? I, I, how many times we fail him? We fail him because my faith is so little. I need stronger faith. I need more faith. I want to know his word more. I want to know his will. I want to hear his voice. I want to see his face. I want to be a better leader. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better person. I want to be a better brother for all of you. We, I want that. You want that. So guess what? I want to draw closer to him. And the closer I get to him, and the closer you get to his light, you're going to start to reveal things in people that wasn't there before. You're going to reveal things in people. And some of those people are very near and dear to you now. Very near and dear to you. And they love you now. But the closer you get to him, you're going to reveal things in them that you're not going to like. Envy and jealousy. And once it gets in, it's a cancer. It will rot the bones. Envy and jealousy, the best thing you can do, present it before God, get it out there, crucify that thing. Because it won't go away on its own. It will just manifest itself into anger and then something much more than that. As far as David goes, as far as David goes, he's already revealed the problems in Saul. But David shows us how we can possess the right kind of attitude and the right kind of spirit to deal with those situations and those problems and those people that mean very much to us. Saul meant everything to David. And yet the guy is throwing spears at him. And he never considered him an enemy. That takes a special kind of anointing. That's a special kind of patience with someone, a special kind of love. We can learn a lot from David. Father, we thank you so much, really, for really preserving this wonderful, wonderful story. Oh, your servant, a man after your own heart. He was so patient. He was so loving. He was so faithful. He was such a good servant, a good shepherd a good warrior. He declared your name and he declared it honestly and boldly. He didn't desecrate it. He didn't blaspheme it. Lord, he showed so much patience with Saul. Lord, I, again, I, as we pray, we all want to draw closer to you. We all want to mature in our faith. We're, we don't want to be on this rung of the ladder in our spiritual maturity with Yeshua as the goal, the bullseye. We don't want to stay where we are. We do want to mature. But Lord, as this lesson has clearly shown us, as we draw closer to you, it's going to reveal some ugly things about people around us that are either not maturing the way they should be or simply are unbelievers. Lord, we have to learn really how to possess the same kind of spirit and attitude that David did. We can deal with these situations like David did. We don't, wanna, we don't want to have people upset with us and angry at us. But Lord, when they are, simply because we declare your name, help us, Lord, to remember this lesson, how your servant handled the situation. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers and thank you in advance, Lord, for answering our prayers. We pray all these things in Yeshua's precious name. Amen.